And welcome to Bible study. Uh, it's Tuesday night. Um, we're going to jump into some things tonight. We're going to go a little bit of a different direction than we usually have been going. Um, and it might get a little teachy. Uh, I, we tend to, in Bible study, get into a lot of, um, you know, extrapolation from the scriptures and how does this apply to us. But tonight it's going to be actually like a Bible study. Let's study what the scriptures say about certain things. Um, we've referred a lot in the past few weeks to different wars that occur in the end times. We've been talking about the Gog-Magog War ever since you know Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where um, there's a lot of speculation as to whether that war is beginning. Um, and then I've heard a lot of people who can tend to kind of get that mixed up with the Battle of Armageddon. Um, it's very common for, for all these wars that are in the Bible to kind of get meshed into one big battle. But there is a distinction between all of them. Um, and I wanted to kind of cover that a little bit. Um, for any further study on it, Billy Broom has some very good teachings on the book of Ezekiel, on the end times wars. Um, and there, the Jewish sages also believe that there are two Gog-Magog wars. We're going to get into a little bit more of who Gog and Magog are. Um, but Billy believes that there are three end-of-day end, end wars that happen. Um, the first being the Ezekiel 38-39 war. We're going to turn there in a little bit. Um, which is an invasion of Israel by Gog's forces. Coalition of nations that are led by Gog. And this war could occur at any point now. We're, we're in the end times. We'll see later on in the study as to why we believe that this could occur at any point. Um, the second war in the end of days is the Battle of Armageddon mentioned in Zechariah 14 and Revelation 16. Um, this occurs at the end of the seven-year tribulation. A lot of people think, well, that's coming into the tribulation, but because of the scenario, because of the setup that's around it, you know that it happens at the end. The Antichrist and his forces are, are a mass there, and all the nations come up. Um, and then Yeshua returns, and the, that war is over in a big way. Um, but these two battles are, are no, no means the same battle. Um, there are spirits that are active in those nations that are controlling them. So when you see hear these certain nations that keep coming up, and you wonder why is it that this one particular nation continues to attack Israel? Why is it that this one particular nation has from its inception seemed to have something against the Jewish people? There are spirits behind it. We know that. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. Um, the third war that is mentioned in the end of days is the war of Revelation 20, verse 8. It's, it happens at the end of the thousand-year millennium which is amazing. I mean, you stop and you think of that. You've had a thousand years of Yeshua the Messiah ruling and reigning on earth. You've had a thousand years of peace. And now suddenly Satan's loose and he's able to stir up nations to start trouble again. Like you would think that after a thousand years, that, that's, that's many generations. It would, you would think it would be weeded out of them. But he goes forth and he deceives the nations. And once again, you have Gog and Magog that come and gather a large army of followers. And in the end, God destroys it with fire from heaven, and that's it. Um, prior to the Gog-Magog War, you also hear of Psalm 83. We've read that before in our Times of Prayer for Daughters for Zion, that, oh, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be in remembrance no more. That war is kind of ongoing. It's been ongoing since Israel's rebirth in 1948. Uh, their goal of those nations is to destroy Israel, to wipe them out. I don't know how many of you had heard of the terrorist attacks that have been going on this week in Israel. Um, Sandra Barris had posted something this, um, actually today, this afternoon, that she had found, uh, heard of another terrorist attack that occurred in B'nai Brak in Israel. There were five people that were killed, several that were wounded. Um, and it's like there's a stirring up in the spirit um, at certain times, especially, in which the, 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 the spirit uh, that operates be behind the religion of Islam is stirred up even more so. We've experienced that at times in Israel when we've gone during the, the, the fast of Ramadan. And there's, an in there's an, more of an intensity to the atmosphere. 
Um, but I think we're in that time period again now. I believe it's Ramadan right now. But the, the, the fact that we need to be making sure that we're applying the blood over Israel and keeping them in our prayers, they are, they are God's timepiece. They're the time clock. But they're also the apple of his eye, and they're, they're at the center of our heart. Um, so as, as, as it goes with Israel, it affects us. Um, so to start, let's turn over to Ezekiel chapter 38. And um, we're going to actually go through the whole chapter of 38 and 39 and see what it talks about in this end time war. So Ezekiel chapter 38, and we'll start at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, of Meshach, and of Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Rosh, of Meshach, and of Tubal. And I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you forth, and all of your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them handling swords. Persia, Cush, and Put, or Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of his hordes, the house of Tor Togerma, and the uttermost parts of the, the north, and all of his hordes. Many people are with you. Now we're going to pause there for a moment and kind of take a look at who's in the play here. Who are these nations that, were, that they're talking about? Um, Magog occurs in the Old Testament four times, that word Magog. Um, it occurs in Genesis 10 to 1 Chronicles 1, 5, Ezekiel 38, and Ezekiel 39. It's identified as a descendant of Japheth. You know, here you have, you have Noah who had Shem, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and they end up spreading out and going across the earth. Um, scholars trace them back, trace Magog, to the ancient Scythians. Uh, that's a whole other study. The Scythians are quite the, the, the interesting culture to study. They were, they were more or less barbarians in some, some senses. Um, and there was a phrase that said that, like, even if, even if you're, I, I think it's in the New Testament, Paul is talking about it at some point, whether you're Jew or Greek or Scythian at one point, he says. So it's like, in other words, you could be the worst barbarian on earth, but you can still be saved through knowledge of Yeshua. Um, the tr these tribes, though, lived in the region north of the Black Sea, so in the area of Russia, your, that whole northern part. Um, there, some consider their territory to stretch from Ukraine to Siberia, so it is a massive, massive amount of, of land area that they covered. Um, Ezekiel describes Gog as the prince of Rosh. Um, Rosh is an ancient word for Russia. You can see the connection there. It's not too hard to see that. Um, and a lot of people say, well, we can't say for sure that these nations are, are, are because that's not the name now. Well, how many nations have changed their name throughout the ages? I mean, if you look even in the Middle East, the nations that are in the Middle East of today that were formed at the same time Israel was created as a state in 1948, they, they didn't exist prior to that as those nations that we know of. They were known by their ancient nomadic names or their tribal, tribal names. Um, so you've got to kind of look, do some digging into what the Bible's talking about. Are they going to say, yeah, the United States of America came up with them? No, the United States of America didn't even exist back then. So you're not going to see that come out there. You're not going to see any of the modern nations come out there except for Israel. So when we're looking at the fact that this is a war that is, it, it is, specifically targeted against Israel. That's one, th that's one way you can always tell where we are in the end times, is you always have to look at Israel. We talked about this on Sabbath. They're the fig tree. Watch the fig tree. You always got to make sure that you're keeping your eye on Israel as God's time clock. They, that's how you know. So the fact that Russia invades Ukraine, that's not the go war of Gog and Magog, because they're not coming against Israel currently. Now, when you start looking behind the scenes, you can see that it's working toward that, but it's not that in and of itself. Um, so it appears that this invasion in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is an army from the north of Israel. Well, you go north of Jerusalem, north of Israel, what's straight north of Israel is Moscow. 
I mean, it, and what's north of Moscow? There's nothing. North Pole. Unless, unless you have an army of penguins coming out after them, I don't think so. Um, in the Septuagint, the name Gog appears in two other places. Now, the Septuagint, you, you think of the ancient manuscripts in the Bible, and this is where a lot of Hebrew scholars get into debates about it, because you can have one account say something that's totally different from another account. So one of the biggest, I'm going to kind of go on a side trail to explain this, but one of the biggest arguments of rabbinical Judaism against Messianic Judaism and the, the idea that Yeshua is the Messiah is, a, is the fact that in, I believe it's in the book of Matthew where he's talking about the genealogies, and this is the amount of people that came out of Egypt. And when you look at it, the, the, the amount, not, with, not out of Egypt, but with Abraham, the amount of people that Abraham had in his family, there's a contradiction between what it says there and what it says in Genesis. So they use that to say, see, the New Testament couldn't even get that straight. Well, if you go back to manuscripts like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, they say the same amount of people as the New Testament says. So it's obvious that the New Testament is pulling heavily from the Septuagint, which is, a, which is a, also a, a very... Um, accurate and reliable source. You know, it's like the works of Josephus. It might not be scripture, but he was a historian that lived in that time, and he has the accurate view of what was going on. Um, and so the Septuagint, the name Gog appears in two other places, and it's very interesting when you look at where it appears. Um, in Numbers 24, verse 7, you have the, the story of a nation that comes up against Israel and attacks them, and it's led by this person named Agag. Remember that whole story we've talked about Agag and his connection to, to Haman and everything? Well, in the Septuagint, they call Agag Gog. There's a very similar similarity between those two names. But when you look at it, it's like talking about spirits that control areas. When you're talking about Gog being the prince of Magog, you're talking about the spirit of Haman. You're talking about that same spirit that has in, in its being, its very being, to destroy the people of God, right from its beginning. If, if, the, if the, at the time when Saul the king was told to wipe out all the Agagites, get rid of them, kill the king, get rid of all of this, if he had done that, we wouldn't have been dealing with Haman. Haman would never have been able to be in existence because that, that lineage would have been wiped out. Um, and a lot of other, you trace that lineage down, it's amazing when you start finding that out. So that's one place that the Septuagint puts it. Another place is in Amos chapter 7. They say Gog instead of mowings, which is an interesting thing. So Gog is a spirit of mows down things in its path. Um, but when you look at it, so you'll come from your place in the far north. Okay, We've already established north of Israel, that's Russia. That's Moscow. Um, but there's two other participants that are named in here, Meshach and Tubal, which, again, you ask different scholars where, where they are. You can have different locations all over the area. But most people agree that that is in the area of Turkey today, modern-day Turkey. Um, so you have now Russia, you have Turkey. Uh, then you have Tubal, which is always grouped with Meshach, which is interesting. They also are in Turkey. So it's all these northern regions above Israel. Uh, well, you look at Turkey today, even just if you look at Turkey of 10 years ago, it was a pretty moderate state. I mean, it's a member of NATO. Um, but it was a pretty moderate state. It was closely tied to Europe. They had very good relations with Europe. But it's increasingly starting to go more toward the radical element. You know, and, and we've seen in recent years, especially over the past couple of years, Turkey's made some pretty strong stances against Israel. It's, it's really starting to draw the line and land on the wrong side of the line. Um, but it is easy to see how, and just the fact that, that um, Erdogan is very closely connected with Putin. It's, there's, there's these connections that are forming. Um, 
added to these. We saw Persia, Kush, and Put, um, and Gomer. So Persia, we all know Persia is modern day Iran. Nobody debates on that. Persia was always the name for Iran until it became modern Iran. Um, but Kush and Put, a lot of people think that that's in the area of Sudan, northern, northern Israel, uh, Israel, Africa, in that area, Libya, put, the Amplified Bible actually says put or Libya. So you have this coalition of mainly Islamic nations that are surrounding Israel, none of which have had any historic friendliness toward Israel. Um, just look at the, the War of Independence, the Six Day War, all the nations that came against Israel during that time. Um, but these people, these nations, are starting to come together in the end of days and form these alliances, strongest of which that we can see right just by looking at our news today is Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Those three are very heavily involved, and they're all on Israel's northern border. I mean, Iran, we, we, we hear, hear that from Eric Stackelbeck all the time. Iran is heavily involved in Syria and in Lebanon. They're in Russia is backing them. So you got this whole thing that's under the surface that all these pieces are starting to move into place. Um, but then it's interesting. Let's continue reading on um, verse 6. Gomer and all of his hordes, um, the house of Torgama, the outermost parts of the north. You, Gog, be prepared. Yes, prepare yourselves, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and you be a guard and a commander for them. After many days you shall be visited and mustered for service. In the latter years you shall go out against the land that is restored from the ravages of the sword. What land is that talking about? It's talking about the land of Israel. Where people are gathered out of many nations upon the mountains of Israel. Here's another indication as to the fact that this is not the war of Ar Battle of Armageddon because we're very clearly told that the Battle of Armageddon will take place in the Valley of Megiddo. This war takes place upon the mountains of Israel. Where are the mountains of Israel? That's the West Bank. That's, that's the places that we've stood. That's the heartland of Israel. So they're coming after the heartland of Israel. Um, uh, upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, but its people are brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell securely, all of them. That has happened. We saw that in, in 1948. Remember the words of Mark Twain when he, he, he had written about it, that it, the place was a desolate waste. Nobody would even want to live there. It was swamps. So everything was infested. And people went in there and drained the swamps. The, the Jewish people went in there after the Holocaust and even prior to um, and started draining those swamps. They had to battle with the malaria and, and the infestation and everything to create Israel what it is today and you wouldn't even recognize it. Um, verse 9, you shall ascend and come like a storm. You shall be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all your hosts and many people with you. Now, I'm, I'm one who believes that's an airstrike. We're talking in, about biblical people who had vision. Ezekiel never saw any kind of helicopters. He never, he never in his lifetime ever saw an airplane. How would you describe something like that if you've never seen it before? Um, you, see, you see throughout the Bible, they, they talk about hordes of locusts that come up and they have like teeth and they have eyes all over them and like all these things. Well, he's, they're trying to find ways to describe things that they've never seen before. Um, in this day and age, yes, they'll ascend and come like a cloud to cover the land. They're coming in an airstrike. You and all your hosts and many people with you. Thus says the Lord God, at the same time, thoughts shall come into your mind, and you will devise an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up against an open country, the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon those who are at rest, who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take spoil and prey, to turn your hand upon the desolate places now inhabited and assail the people gathered out of the nations who have obtained livestock and goods who dwell at the center of the earth. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all of their lion-like cubs shall say to you, have you come to take spoil? 
Have you gathered your hosts to take the prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take a great spoil? Now, interesting. So you look at, the, at these, these people are not part of this coalition coming up against Israel. They're standing aside saying, hey, why are you coming up against Israel? Why are you attacking? You're going to go and take spoil? Sheba and Dedan are in the area of modern-day uh, Saudi Arabia. So looking at that in light of the recent, um, over the past year, the, the, the ties that have been formed between Israel and Saudi Arabia. I mean, we've never seen that type of a um, peaceful and actually um, like joining together of Saudi Arabia with Israel. Uh, it, Saudi Arabia has made some, some changes, and they've been moving further away from the radical element, and they are trying to open up into more. Plus, they realize that uh, Iran is an em enemy to all of them. Iran is, he, they would just as much attack Saudi Arabia as they would attack Israel. Um, and so it's interesting that you see this in, in this chapter, that they're standing by the side and not joining in with them. Uh, verse 14. So, therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, in the day when my people Israel dwell securely, will you not know it and be aroused? And you will come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army. This is kind of a funny side note, but I saw, I saw a post on Facebook that said, Maybe the gas prices nowadays are why the end time army is riding horses. You know, it's possible. Um, and you shall come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. Again, it says like a cloud. He keeps using this same phraseology. In the latter days, I will bring you against my land that the nations may know, understand, and realize me when my holiness shall be vindicated through you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in olden times by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for years that I would bring you against them? But in that day when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord, my wrath shall come up into my nostrils. For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I said, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking or cosmic catastrophe in the land of Israel. It's a supernatural earthquake it's referring to there. So that the fishes of the sea and the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are on the face of the earth shall tremble and shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and with pestilence and bloodshed I will enter into judgment with Gog, and I will rain upon him and his hordes, and upon the many peoples that are with him, torrents of rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I demonstrate my greatness and my holiness, and I will be recognized, understood, and known in the eyes of many nations. Yes, they shall know that I am the Lord." Uh, chapter 39, and you, son of man, prophesy against Gog. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Rosh, of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about and will lead you on and will cause you to come up from the uttermost parts of the north and will lead you against the mountains of Israel. And I will smite your bow from your left hand and will cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. Now, looking at it, you got to always look at what they're talking about in the Bible in light of modern day, like what, what we would say modern day. I don't think they're going to be fighting with bows and arrows upon the mountains of Israel. What do we have now that they use? What do we know that Iran is armed with, that, that Russia is armed with? Missiles. Missiles that they shoot like arrows from their, their launchers. And he says that he's going to cause it to fall in other words, it's not going to reach its target. You shall fall dead upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your hosts and the people who are with you. I will give you to the ravenous birds of every sort and the beasts of the field shall to be devoured. You shall fall in the open field, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. I will send fire on Magog and upon those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord. 
and I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. And the nations shall know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. We talk about an end time great awakening. That would be a quite an awakening when you see God come and defend his people against this invasion. Behold, it is coming and it will be done, says the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. And when you, Gog, are no longer, they who dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and set on fire and burn the battle gear, the shields and bucklers, the bows and arrows, the hand spikes or riding whips, and they shall burn them as fuel for seven years. There's a good indication as to when this happens. When do we see another seven-year period of time as the tribulation? Um, so that my people shall take no firewood out of the field or cut down any out of the forest, for they shall make their fires of the weapons. Um, and they shall despoil those who despoiled them and plunder those who plundered them, says the Lord God. Looking at that verse for, for an instant, instance, you see that they're burning all these weapons for seven years. And throughout, throughout the, the ages, people have wondered, how is that possible? How do you have so many weapons that people can use that for fuel and burn them in the fire? Well, we live in a day of nuclear weapons and nuclear capability. And it's quite feasible that you can see that nuclear power can easily power a nation for an extended period of time. Um, verse 11, and in that day I will give to Gog a place for burial there in Israel, the valley of those who pass through on the east side in front of the Dead Sea, and it will delay and stop those who pass through. And there they shall bury Gog in all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog, the multitude of Gog. For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them, that they may cleanse the land." Now, that's an interesting statement. Why would they, first of all, why would they have to cleanse the land? Second of all, why does it take seven months to bury them? Let's read on. Yes, all the people of the land will bury them, and it shall bring them renown on the day that I shall be glorified, says the Lord. And they shall set apart men to work continually. In other words, they're hiring these people for the specific purpose, who shall pass through the land, men commissioned to bury with the help of those that are passing by, those bodies that lie unburied on the face of the ground in order to cleanse the land. After the end of seven months, they shall make their search. And when any, anyone passes through the land and anyone sees a human bone, he shall set up a marker by it as a sign to the buriers until they have buried it. Now, you start looking at the, the whole language that's used in this. First of all, why do they have to cleanse the land? Second of all, somebody sees a human bone sticking up. They're not like, oh, here's a bone. I'm going to go and bury it. You know, they're going to put a sign by it and say, this is for specific people to go and take care of that. It could be anything. It could be a bone. It could be anything that's contaminated. Again, in light of the current weapons that we have, nuclear weapons, there is actual um, documentation within the, the Department of Defense that, that lays out how you would have to decontaminate an area, how you would have to, what would the process be to be able to cleanse an area after a nuclear weapon has gone. And it's very similar to this. You have specific people that have to go and do this so that the land is no longer contaminated. They're bringing it to a place Beyond the Dead Sea, if you guys remember where the dead, when we're traveling down that area through the Dead Sea, on the side of the Dead Sea, you've got those mountains. It's all barren wilderness out there. There's not going to be anybody that's going in that area. But if anybody sees it, they're going to set up a marker and say, no, you're not touching that because it's contaminated. Somebody specific has to go in and do that. And it does take quite a while to decontaminate an, an area. Just look, at, just look at some of the places, the Chernobyl d disaster. How long did it take for that? Still, some areas are contaminated with stuff. Um, and Hamana, multitude, shall also be the name of the city of the dead. Thus shall they cleanse the land. And you, son of man, thus says the Lord, say to the birds of prey of every sort and to every beast of the field, 
assemble yourselves and come. Remember, Israel is one of the major migration routes for the, for the birds that migrate through. That's, that's right along that. I can remember Ari showing us the, the map. See the layers, you know. Yeah, so you have the map of Israel, and right there is the, is the great African Rift Valley. It's the major route of migration from the north down to Africa. And in that, during that time of migration in the spring and the fall, those that, especially the Valley of Hula up by the, in the northern part of Israel, it just has millions of birds. I've always thought that would be a neat time to be in Israel to see all that. But th this is right on that migration route. So it kind of points to a timing as to when this happens, if you, if you pay attention to the migration routes. Assemble yourselves and come, gather from every side to the sacrificial pre feast that I am preparing for you, even a great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel, at which you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats and bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you are filled and drink blood till you are drunk at the sacrificial feast which I am preparing for you. And you shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men and with soldiers of every kind, says the Lord. And I will manifest my honor and glory among the nations. Here's that phrase again. He's doing it to manifest his honor and glory among the nations. And all the nations shall see my judgment and justice, which I have executed and my hand, which I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know, understand, and realize beyond all question that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the nations shall know, understand, and realize that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me, and I hid my face from them. So, they, so I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the power of the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them and hid my face from them. So all this stuff of Israel being in exile and things not being as they were supposed to be is because they rebelled against the Lord because of their sin. Easy to point the finger at them, but let's look at our own lives and see where are we exiled from the land that he's called us to because of our sin. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 25, now will I reverse the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. They shall forget their shame and self-reproach and all their treachery and unfaithfulness in which they have transgressed against me when they dwell securely in their land and there is none who makes them afraid. When I have brought them again from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and my justice and holiness are set apart, then shall they know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord their God because I sent them into captivity and exile among the nations and then gathered them to their own land. I will leave none of them remaining among the nations anymore in the latter days. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them when I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, says the Lord God. So it's quite the, quite the scenario here. And I have to admit that there, there's been, I hadn't read through the entire account like I did over the past week, but as we're starting to talk about coming toward the end times and we want to know what's going on, we want to know at what point we are in time, we need to know what to look for. Shua said, watch, watch the signs of the times, be aware. He, he didn't want us to be in the dark about what's going on. We're not supposed to be ones who are just in the mystery. Oh, wow, I didn't even see anything going on, didn't know anything was coming, suddenly he came. There's signs. If you know what to look for, there's always signs. And the signs are all, all around us as to what's going on. First of all, it speaks of that it's, this happens in the latter years. Okay, We're in the latter years now. But it, not only is it in the latter years, Ezekiel then changes it to say in the latter days. So you're at the end days of the latter years. This is right at the very end of all things. Um, so this is when this Gog Magog war will take place. It also says that it's when Israel has been regathered and given their father's land. Well, that's happened. You know, 1948, Israel cut, got back that land. When Israel dwells safely, when it's a land of unwalled villages. Now, Israel obviously always faces terrorist attacks. It always faces, you know, issues. But Israelis in general have never felt more secure than they do today. 
There's never been a time when Israel has felt more like this is our land, we're dwelling, we're here, we're here to stay as they do now. So that's another good indication. It says when Israel is, is prosperous. Well, Israel has a flourishing um, flourishing economy. It has a flourishing, uh, they, they're one of the leading exports of produce in that area of the world. And in recent times, they've discovered a massive oil field, a uh, natural gas field off the coast of Israel. Um, now we come to the issue of why is it that these nations come up against Israel? Why is it that these nations just suddenly decide we're going to come up against Israel? Um, well, for one, look at the current um, president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. He has had a goal of rebuilding Soviet Russia. That's, that's, that he's bent on that. He's driven to do that. And he's failing rather miserably at it because uh, he can't even do it in Ukraine. Um, but that is, that is one of his big goals right now. Because of all the sanctions that have been put on Russia, because so many nations have cut off, they're not going to buy their oil, they're not going to get their gas from Russia anymore. Because of that, Israel now stands as Russia's leading competitor. So that right there puts them at that place where, where they're, in, they're in Russia's sights. Um, Israel makes the statement, OK, Russia, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have invaded Ukraine. We're against that. Next day, Russia comes back and says, hey, we don't re recognize that you have a right to the Golan Heights. So all these things are starting to, 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 to jump into place. They're all starting to fall into place. Uh, interestingly enough, though, back when Israel became a nation, Russia did back them. Russia did side with them and supported them, which is kind of ironic. Um, one of their best friends in the region was, was the Shah of Iran. That was before Iran became the radical um, Islamic state that it is now. Um, and even, even the United States had a better relation with Iran at that time. But the, the friends that it once had in the, in the region have now become its enemies, have now turned completely against it. So when you put all these things into place, and then the fact that Russia has long backed the Iranian regime, they're, they're still supplying Iran with nuclear capabilities, they're still backing Hezbollah, they're still involved on Israel's borders. You can see how it's setting up to the fact that if Israel, Israel's not going to allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon, they can't. Because uh, Iran has already stated, if we get this power, we're going to use it to destroy Israel. If you had a nation sitting on your border that was like, if we get these weapons, we're going to destroy you, well, how, how would you react to that? You have no choice. Israel's a small enough nation that all it takes is one, one of those bombs, the nation's gone, and they're not going to allow that to happen. So what about the Islamic nations that are joining Russia? Like, why is it that these Islamic nations suddenly decide that they're going to join Russia? Are they, are they bent on the prosperity of Israel? Not so much. They're more focused on their holy war. We've talked about that before, jihad. So where, what, do, what do Muslims believe about the end, end of days and the end times prophecies and the coming of the Messiah and all that? It's very interesting, because when you look at if you want to say Islamic eschatology, their study of the entes, it's similar to ours, but with some twists. So in Islamic eschatology, there's going to be a false messianic figure that's going to come right before the end of time. Uh, after a reign of 40 days or 40 years, he'll be destroyed by the Messiah, Christ, which they do believe is, is the Messiah, or both, and the world will submit to Allah. The Antichrist, or al-Dajjal, as they say, first appeared in Christian literature, and it's reworked in sayings ascribed to the prophet Muhammad. So they took that, the sayings that were talked about the Antichrist and kind of just reworked it, and now Muhammad said it. They do that in a lot of things. It's kind of interesting. There he is described as a plump, one-eyed man with ruddy face and curling hair and the Arabic letters KFR, which is unbelief, on his forehead. Sounds similar to the 666 thing? Yeah. 
Al-Dajjal will appear during a period of great tribulation. He will be followed by the Jews and will claim to be God in Jerusalem. See the similarities? Now, you know what we've talked about before is the enemy never comes up with something. He can never invent something on his own. He always takes something that's truth and will twist it. Twist it just a little bit so that it seems like it's still true, but it's not. Um, he will work false miracles and most people will be deceived. At this moment will occur the second coming of Christ, which they do believe Jesus is coming again, which is interesting. Then the Mahdi, a righteous man descendant from Muhammad, will assist the prophet, Je who is assisted by the prophet Jesus, will return to earth, defeat the Dajjal, and establish a period of peace. Except, in their belief, Jesus is going to say that he's actually a Muslim and the entire world needs to convert to Islam. So, that's what their belief is about the end times. Also, they believe that this will only happen when they can conquer Israel. You see the motivation? It's this, the element of jihad in the, in, in the religion that is driving them to say, I'm going to bring the Mahdi's coming. I'm going to bring this end times to a close by attacking Israel, by coming against Israel, and I'm going to force this to happen. Again, they're motivated by the enemy, obviously. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's the spirit against them. But all these nations form this alliance, maybe for different reasons. Russia is not motivated by holy war. But they form this alliance to come against Israel. And they figure that by their forces, all those forces together, you know, Israel in, in the natural could not withstand those forces. But... Then again, Israel has withstood forces that in the natural they couldn't withstand before. Right from the, I mean, think of it, 1948. This is a nation, a group of people that has just survived the Holocaust, that has just come out of the gas chambers of Europe and is now forming a nation and instantly they're attacked. Instantly, like the instant they de declare statehood, they're attacked by all these nations around them. And suddenly, why is it that they win? Why is it that they are not defeated? There's no natural explanation for that. When we watch the, the against all odds, you see that. And time and time and time again in Israel's history, that is the case, right from their beginning. For, through the Bible, their deliverance from Egypt, their, their deliverance from Pharaoh's army, their deliverance from the Agagites, their deliverance from all the people that would continuously come up with against them. Where are all those people today? You know, where are the Hittites today? Where are the Jebusites? Where are the, where are the Canaanites? Where, where are the Perizzites? Where are all these nations that it talks about that came against Israel today? Where, where are the Ottoman Turks today? Where is Nazi Germany today? Everyone who has lifted a hand against Israel has ended up destroyed. You would think that people would look at that and learn a lesson from it. But again, we talk about the blinding spirit that is upon people's eyes. We talk about the deception that the enemy comes to try to work. And he really is masterful at deceiving the world. So people actually are so blinded that they believe that they'll be able to accomplish this because they don't believe that God will come out and help the people of Israel. So in this uh, current inv invasion of Ukraine by by Russia. I don't believe that's the war of Gog and Magog, but I believe it's a pre, pre, uh, prerequisite. It's something that's leading up to it. Um, it's a precursor is what I mean to say, not prerequisite. Precursor to it. But that war could begin any day now. It could begin 10 years from now or it could begin two minutes from now. We're at that point in history where all the things have fallen into place and it's just that one act that takes place. Um, again, d some differences, again, between the War of Gog and Magog and the Battle of Armageddon. I'm not going to have time to go into the Battle of Armageddon tonight, but you can go and look that up yourself in Zechariah 14 and Revelation chapter 16. But the Armageddon battle involves all the world nations. That's when all the nations of the world come down to battle against Israel. 
Um, but the Battle of Armageddon, I mean, the Battle, the War of Gog and Magog involves only select nations. It's not the whole world coming against them. Um, China, you don't see mentioned in the Gog and Magog War, but they're in the, the, the Battle of Armageddon. Um, and then you see the Antichrist taking part in the Battle of Armageddon, but he's not mentioned in the War of Gog and Magog. So at the end of Armageddon, you see Yeshua comes and stands on the Mount of Olives, and that's when everybody sees and recognizes. But the, the, the interesting thing when you start looking at it is where does the United States fit in prophecy? You know, a lot of people say it doesn't appear. It's not there. Again, Israel, uh, the United States was not even in existence back when the Bible was written. So it's hard to say where it could be referenced. But in Revelation 12, through four, 12 verse 14, it says, The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness where she, she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. There are some speculation that that could be referring to the United States. The United States has all had the, the symbol of the eagle as our, as our symbol throughout our, our, um, our time. So it's possible that in the end times, the United States is that eagle that protects Israel. I, I, I'm still of one that believes that we need to believe for our nation to be a sheep nation, not a goat nation. That we are siding with Israel, that we're not going to leave our friend. Um, we've been tied at the hip to Israel from our birth. I mean, the very founders of our nation founded it after the pattern of biblical Israel. We've seen that through Jonathan Kahn, what he's talked about. And, and we need to be making sure that everything that we're, we're speaking over the United States is in line with what we want to happen, okay? It's easy to say, well, you know, this, this nation's going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing that can help. It, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's going down the tubes. Well, this, that's what you want to happen. I don't think that that's what we want to happen. Um, so when, when you... When you look at the rapture of the church, we talk about the rapture of the church, and a lot of people, you know, you have the different camps that, that land either, okay, well, it's going to happen before the tribulation. Some believe it's going to happen mid-tribulation. Some believe it hap happens at the end of the tribulation, which that one to me doesn't quite make sense because why after everything bad has happened in the world, okay, now I'm going to take you out. Doesn't doesn't seem to make sense. But I, I'm one who believes that the rapture happens before the tribulation for one reason well, for many reasons, but one of the reasons I believe it happens is because it talks about that the, the Antichrist can't come on the scene until he who restrains is taken out of the way. That's the presence of the church in the earth, the presence of Holy Spirit operating through the church. Once that restraining force is removed, that lawless one is revealed. And at that point, it's literally all hell is breaking loose. That is not a point that, that you want to be here on the earth. That is not a point that things, are, that things are going to turn out well for you. But at that point, I believe that, that this war, Gog and Magog, could, be, could take place either right before the rapture happens, like here's the battle, the rapture happens, or the rapture takes place like right before that, that battle. Because then you have the stage set perfectly for the Antichrist to come on the world. I'm going to come on and bring peace. I mean, just look at what happened even in, even in Nazi Germany, okay? You have Germany came out of World War I, which was supposedly the world to, war to end all wars. Um, but then there, there's Germany, a crippled nation. Like, they've just been hurt by war. They, don't, they are trying to recover. And this man comes on the scene, and he promises that he's going to get the nation back on their feet. He's going to build it so that it's better than it ever was before. And that he's going to, he makes all these promises that everybody's gonna, gonna be taken care of by the government and everything. Really, it's the socialistic idea. Um, and that's how he was able to come. If Hitler had come on the scene saying, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna destroy all these nations and I'm gonna wipe out all these people, nobody would have accepted him. Do you think the Antichrist is gonna come on the scene saying all that? No. He's going to come on as a man of peace. And you know what? The world is set up more than ever before. I don't know about you, but walking through the past two years of this pandemic and scamdemic, 
um, is looking at it and seeing how easily people gave up literally every right they had. Literally every right they had because of fear, because of what they were told by those in authority, because of they were motivated by, well, it's for the good of all. It's for the better good. How many, how, how many times did we hear all that? And you look at it and you're like, my goodness. I mean, prior to this, I, I, dad and I used to have conversations and mom used to have conversations like, we just don't see it happening. I just don't see how the world is just going to accept the Antichrist. How is that even going to be set up that everybody's going to get into this one world system, one world alliance, everything's going to be like that. I just don't see it happening. But we're set up for it now. We're, the world is primed for it. And I believe that while this incident over the past couple of years didn't have anything to do with the Antichrist in and of itself, I believe it is a testing period to see how willing people are to accept it. How ready are, they, are you to accept it? Can we push it just a little further? And the challenge is once you push that line further as far as what rights you're willing to give up for something, they're not going to give it back to you. Not easily. Then you get to the point where you have to stand up and be willing to stand up for what you believe in, fight for what you believe in. And that's the point we're at. The signs are all around us. In the heavens, we've talked about that from the time of the blood moons that we saw. There have been sign after sign after sign as to where we're standing. The question is, are you ready for it? Are we ready? Are we as a people ready? And we, that's something that we got to examine. Again, locate yourself is something that Dad always said. We've got to locate ourselves where we're at, seeing the things that are going on in the world. Do they strike fear in our hearts? Do they cause us to, to have any kind of doubts or questions? Or are we so lulled to sleep by, yes, this is just another phase in the world and things are just going to continue on? We've got to be awake. We've got to be alert. But we've got to not let ourselves get into fear by what we're seeing. What is it that Yeshua said? When all these things begin to take place, lift your heads, look up, because your redemption draws nigh. We're closer than ever to that final redemption. And what a glorious day that will be. But until that time, we've got to be about our Father's business. We've got to be about his work. We've got to be bringing people into the kingdom because we really don't want them to be part. We don't want them to be left behind during that time. And it's going to be an exciting time to be a part of. It's the best time for us to be a part of. Remember, I mean, no other generation has seen this. Yeshua said that the generation that sees the rebirth of Israel will not pass away before all is fulfilled. That's an exciting time, point of time to be at, and that's where we are right now. Amen? Well, I hope you learned something tonight, and we will see you on Saturday at 11 a.m. Until then, you have a blessed week. Ahem. <clears throat>